Hello there, and welcome to my complete beginner's guide for Against the Storm. In this video, I will give you a quick and solid overview about all things that you need to know to enjoy this game. I will guide you through the map selection, the basics of the game, how to win it, how to draft your between your decisions, and I'll also give you at the end of the video a basic setup that you can use as a foundation for your adventures, or you just find out for yourself what kind of starting setup you like. For this purpose, I've made up an entirely fresh profile. This is entirely unplayed, there's uh, no progress on it whatsoever. So this will look like your game will look like when you've been through the in-game tutorial. So the first part of this video, we're going to talk about the map selection screen here and what we're supposed to do here. This is your home base and your goal is to reach the seals, reforge them before the cycle ends. Whenever a cycle ends, all the cities you have built will go back home, everybody will hide in the castle, a big bad fat storm will come, the whole world will be changed, and we rinse and repeat. For every seal that we reforge, we have a longer time frame before the storm kicks in, and you get other rewards. As you can see, there are circles and circles, and the further you go outside, the harder the game gets and more seals await you, so you have a nice progression system to go through. When we go over here, we can here select where we want to go. The bread icons you see are the rewards that you get, which allow you to unlock new things in the Smoldering City. In the Smoldering City, you have a big upgrade tree where you can buy yourself permanent upgrades that last between the runs and between the cycles. So that is your permanent progression tree. You also have an achievement system called Deeds, so you unlock new things like upgrades, but most of the time experience points to upgrade your account level, so to say. And with a higher account level, you unlock new things here on the tree. So that's how this part of the game works. I don't think I need to explain that much more. So when you select your area, there's different biomes, the woodlands, the marshlands, the scarlet orchard, the, marsh, uh, the cursed royal woodlands, to make, name a few. There's also special world map modifiers. Sometimes they are beneficial and sometimes they are bad. So for example, this one is a beneficial one. And then there's also points of interest. So if you get into the area of these, these are kind of a random event where you sometimes have to defeat the map under special circumstances to gain special bonuses. Different things will happen. Very, very different things. So your goal is at the beginning to select what kind of seal you want to tackle, and then start planning your route. As you see, we can only settle so and so far away from the main capital, and every city you build will extend your reach success uh, succeedingly as you get closer to the seal. For beginners, I'd strongly recommend to begin your journeys in the Royal Woodlands, as this is one of the easiest biomes. So we go here, and we click there, and now we select what kind of people we want to start with, and what kind of gear you want to start with. As a beginner's tip, go for beavers, as these produce wood, and wood is a very, very vital resource for the entirety of the game. These guys are really cool, as you will have lots of wood supply with these. The other items down here, well, the more experienced you get with the game, the more these things will say to you. But for starters, it's totally okay to aim for the caravan with the most beavers, as these ease up your early game a lot. We also get to choose embarkation bonuses. As you see, we have a couple of points that we can use, and we can there just pick up some food, and some building material, that's totally okay and enough. So you can and should read the summary of these and your winning conditions. As you can see here, that's very important, what kind of resources you will get from the trees and what kind of resources you get from the biome. When you're totally new to the game, you can pretty easily skip over these, but as you have played like five or 10 colonies, you will notice that these informations get more and more interesting and important. 
And the difficulty level is ranging from Settler to Viceroy. And if you have beaten your first game on the Viceroy difficulty, you will unlock prestige layers. As a beginner, I'd strongly recommend you to go for a difficulty like Pioneer or even Settler. It depends on your own taste, how much you want to challenge yourself. I wouldn't recommend to go on Viceroy difficulty right from the get-go, out of the simple reason that you unlock more and more things you can use in the game, and it's much, much harder to win a Viceroy game without a leveled up account than it is with, with a leveled up account. I tried, I felt like it was not so much of an enjoyable um, experience, so feel free to bang down one or two games on Pioneer or Veteran difficulty to get acquainted with the game. Now, we're going to play on Veteran, and this includes the Black Rod and Corruption elements, as you see here. There's new elements included here. Blight Rot and Corruption are easily explained as factors that kill your people. You will need so-called so Blight Fighters, and you can just imagine this as fires that break out, and you need a fire department to quench it. They need a fuel to quench these uh, fires. Blight Rot cysts. They destroy these. It's just like that. Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After selecting your map, you get presented the forest mysteries and the current effects. When you play prestige levels, you get all manner of different effects here. Here, there's always one positive effect that usually is happening in the first of three seasons, the so-called drizzle season. Drizzle is the first season, then we have uh, the clearance season. These are the friendly seasons. Drizzle is the friendliest season, the clearance is the harvest season, and then comes the storm season, the name-giving season of the game. So during the storm, all manner of different negative things happen, and you should keep an eye out on these, as these are your modifiers that are working for your current game. As you see, they all have a number above them, telling you on what hostility level they will happen. But more about that in a hot minute. Now, we click that away, and now you see your um, area here. You can just uh, scroll with your mouse wheel or Q and E. I guess the controls should be pretty clear. Over here, we have our hearth. This is where people make their fire, and if the fire here goes out, you practically lose the game. There's always got to be fire in the hearth, because if there's no fire in the hearth, I don't know why, but they just go crazy. Anyways, you can select here at that area, what kind of, what worker is supposed to be working here. This element is for all manner of workshops, true. And over here, we can now select what kind of fuel we want to use. I strongly recommend you to only use wood at the beginning and save up your coal for other things, but you can use that to your own liking. You see here how long one unit burns, and you can also set up a prioritization system. So for example, with a config like that, they will always try to burn wood first before they go to the other resources. Down here we see all manner of different informations that we don't need right now. Now, this is your warehouse, and in this game, Resources are always present in all warehouses at the same time. So if you build another warehouse, it contains the same items as this warehouse. So there's no logistics between warehouses. Very important to note. Now, down here we see our reputation bar, and right next to that, the Queen's Impatience. If the blue bar is full, you win the map. If the red bar is full, you lose the map. The Queen's Impatience, as you see here, increases by a fixed amount per minute, and the reputation goes up only if either your colonists are very happy, or you fulfill certain quests, so-called orders. Down here we have our building menu. You can build paths and different resource collection camps, food production, housing, all manner of different processing and industry production buildings, city service buildings, and decorations. Here we can designate where wood will be chopped, and that's pretty much it. Now, I want to talk about the three big R's of Against the Storm now. That's resources, resolve, and reputation. Resources, as you see here, are everywhere. If you hold down B, you get them highlighted. As you see here, we have berry bushes, we have here clay, we have here 
trees. So these are the resources that we can gather early on. If you click any resource, you will always get an information what kind of uh, collection camp you will need for that. So the clays need stone cutters, these guys need herbalists, and the great outbuilding is always a special extra building that we need to unlock first. These resources are vital to your survival. Without them, you cannot do anything. So you can just select the building either by clicking here or you select the collection building in the respective menu there. It's up to you. Now, these resources will be either consumed directly, like food will be eaten by your people. You see your food stockpiles up here. So we start with a couple of eggs and roots and your people will eat that food raw and processed as well. But if they don't have any processed food, they will eat it raw as well. And we have processable resources like clay, copper ore and the like, which will be processed in your industries. You start out with very basic industries. There's always a crude workstation which allows you to process raw material into building material of sophisticated kind. You always have a makeshift post, which allows you to use the gathered resources and pack them into packs that you can use for trade or for questing. And that's the basics that you do with your resources. These are mandatory as if your people don't eat, they will ultimately die. Duh. But some resources also make people especially happy. So for example, there's so-called complex food, which is produced by putting these raw foods into sophisticated buildings. But as you see here, we don't have any of these yet. These have to be drafted. I want to talk about the drafting system in a hot minute. So that's what we work with to do resources. Don't worry, I'll be explaining it a little bit more in detail how you process these in a second. The resolve down here is the next thing I want to talk about. Like I said, if this meter is high enough, you will gain victory points. So you see that blue blip here? As soon as your resolve is high enough to hit that, you will gain victory points. You can also gain victory points by fulfilling orders for the queen, which will pop up up here after a while. But that is the two ways that you gain victory points. The third way is by exploring the glades outside here. Sometimes the events on dangerous glades yield victory points as well. Sometimes you also find treasure caches that you can turn into reputation points as well. But all in all, these are, you need resolve to keep your colony alive and you can also use it as a victory mechanic. All right, so far so good. Now, I want to talk about the drafting system here real quick. When you click here, you see there's a three and you can now select between different buildings to choose from. These are either producers, like you see here, the farms, or collection camps like the foragers camp and there's also industries we have no fertile soil around us so these uh, are not too interesting so we're going to select a farm nevertheless because this is always a nice thing to choose from but here that's what i wanted to see so you see here now the carpenter the weaver and the leather worker and you see these guys can produce all manner of different things Check the magnifying glass so you can check out in detail how these buildings work. They always have a star rating showing you the material efficiency. That means the leather worker is using very low amounts of uh, resources to produce water skins comparatively to a building that had only one star. You would, could produce water skins in both buildings, but this one uses up the least leather and other optional resources to get the job done. That's how, how, you, uh, how these stars are meant. Every one of these production cycles, as you see here, has this icon here, and when you click it, there's different selections. That means water skins have a fixed input of leather, but you can here work with either two units of oil or two units of meat to get the fat component into. And for fabric, it's the same. Fabric can be plant fiber, leather, or reed, and so on and so forth. You will see the system everywhere in the game. This game loves to get the job done with various resources, so there's a lot of complexity in there. 
Every building that you can draft also has a specialization bonus. Some species are especially happy with doing cloth works. Some are especially good at doing meat works. So you can check that with your species if you hover above them. As you see here, they are gifted woodworkers and they enjoy engineering. That means they get extra yields from wood and they are happy if they go into engineering. Enjoy means happiness plus resolve and gifted or whatever it's uh, worded is where they shine at. So for proper drafting, I highly recommend you to use these picks wisely. Don't feel forced to pick too early. You can stall that for however long you want, as there is no time limit for these. The only thing is to worth uh, mentioning here is that before I choose this, I can see the next draft. So you have to choose eventually. Okay, now we know a few things about the game, so let's go and talk about what you should do at the very beginning. As you see here, you have homeless people, and you see how many people are free, and how many people you have totally uh, of, that, uh, of that faction. So, I'll be setting up now a very basic setup for you that'll also explain how the buildings work. So first thing, we build a woodcutter's camp. We rotate that towards the forest, preferably to the direction where you want to open up your first glade. And I do two of these, as I personally think two woodcutters camp are absolutely mandatory. Up here, you see now that the drizzle is lasting three and a half minutes. And when that's through, we will see the clearance season. And when that's through, we'll see, we will see the storm season. That's the cycle of the game. The thing is, during the storm season, your people will hit, will be hit by a large penalty on their resolve. So the idea is, during the happy seasons, your people can be happy, and during the storm seasons, you will be struggle to survive because often this goes into negatives, and your game's job, your your job is to make sure that they don't run away by providing them enough food, shelter, and all those things. All right. Now, the woodcutters camp, as you see here, have different job slots. You can either click these job slots to put somebody in here. You can also click the beaver and put them in like there. You can also put them in like this. There's a lot of uh, quality of life that you can go for. All right. When you hold down your left alt key, you can also highlight all the workers and all the buildings. As you see here now, only two builders are left and the rest of them are working in the woodcutters. Now, for the woodcutters, it's really important configure them. I personally recommend that you should only go for marked trees, as this way nobody will accidentally open up a glade. Sometimes it's really bad to open up a glade. Danger glades, for example, have always an event in their center that will start ticking the moment you opened up the glade. Therefore, you probably want to be prepared properly. You surely don't want to open that accidentally. So with only marked trees, you go like there. If you hold down left shift while clicking one of these, you change that setting for all of your cams. Pretty nifty little thing. So now we select that axe thing. And as you see here, I hold down the left mouse button to mark these. You can hold down control. So while you're holding down control, as you see, I cannot open up a glade while I'm holding down control. And you can also hold down shift. So you have a tiny dot to use. Those are little things that you can use. Now let's unpause the game and we see our woodcutters are directly going to work. I personally aim them this direction because they chop the wood, they pack it back in and they go more often to their hut than they go back to the warehouse in case you are wondering why I'm orienting them like that and not back to the warehouse. Now, another system you ha will have to work with are cornerstones. Cornerstones are like your trades for the run. These are unique for every game and they are very, very powerful. Often they even give you a road to victory, so choose them wisely. And as a rule of thumb, whenever a cornerstone gives you a resource for free per minute, these are among the strongest. Or generally when you get some product for free, it's also very strong. Apart from that, it's depending on your strategy. Here, for example, peasant supplies is really nice. As with, as with packs of provision, we can do trade. All right, as you see here now, these woodcutters are doing their thing. 
and we gain wood. Materials are first always transported to the respective building and then they get transported back to the next warehouse. That's the circle that these, the cycle that all of these buildings go. Now, next stop, we build a couple of shelters for all of your people. And don't worry too much about uh, where you place them down. You can move pretty much everything in the game. It's just important to note resource collection camps can always be moved for free. Stuff like the housing here does cost some wood when you place it back down. Since your people have to take regular breaks, it does pay off to think about where you put the housing. The paths are completely free and offer a five person movement bonus. So it's really, really useful to use them wherever you want. The demolition hotkey V is also important to note that you always get 100% of the invested material back. So don't worry to build something, even if it is only for a short amount of time, because you need it right now, because there is nothing that you need to worry about. You just have what you need. Okay, so we can now set up a stonecutters camp here and as you see here i have built it not uh, i've built it a little bit narrow you can cut away trees if you need to all right so the next thing we're going to build up for ourselves are the crude workstation and the makeshift post all right and with that, you have a very basic yet fundamental setup together that works for most settlements. Two woodcutters, a couple of houses, and the makeshift post and the crude workstation. As soon as you have unlocked the encampment and the um, un and the upgrade tree, you can also just put a couple of uh, simple decorations on top of that, and you get an instant plus two on the resolve of your entire colony. Just simple like that. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are the orders. So you see here that you have three packages containing orders and you see here these unlock later. When you click pick, you notice that you get a quest. These are basic quests. You get to do something specific like build 35 paths and you get a perk that your people are moving faster on roads and we get some stone. Here again, you don't need to choose immediately, but you lock the other packages when you have clicked one. Here again, if you are insecure, if you are able to fulfill that task, always choose first the task that you know that you can't fulfill. Because there is always a reputation point as a reward for each and every one of these packages. As you see, there is a total amount of 10 of these orders and we need a total amount of um, I think it's 14 or is it 12 I haven't counted on lower difficulty since a while so yeah so it's uh, it's 12 so a majority of your victory points you could get out of the order system so that's why choose quests that you can resolve it's really really good okay so I want to talk about the hostility system next the hostility system is what makes your people unhappier. For each point of hostility, you lose two points of resolve on everybody in your colony. The hostility goes up by a variety of factors. Most important factors, the amount of people, the amount of woodcutters currently, and the amount of glades that you've opened, and the amount of time that has passed. So, in a nutshell, you notice the more you do to win the game, the more the, the forest will hate you. So it's a constant struggle against the clock, as this will make your city succeedingly more unhappy. To add insult to injury, every level of hostility gives you, during the storm season, an extra high penalty. So during the regular season, it's just a minus two per hostility level. During the storm season, it's a extra minus four per hostility level, so people will suffer a lot from that. That's why you want to have as much resolve as possible. All right, we pretty much have covered the basics of the game. I want to explain real quick how the industries work, and then I go over the plates, and uh, then pretty much everything that you need to know has been explained, although there's a lot more that 
you should know, of course. So I'm placing down another of these uh, camps. I also want to mention that these camps use a resource called parts. Parts are not producible by yourself for the majority of the time and therefore very valuable. Sometimes you just use a camp for a while and then you rip it down when the resource node is uh, emptied so you get your parts back. Absolutely legit, absolutely viable and I do that all day. So. Once the industrial buildings are built, you can put workers in there as you've put workers into the woodcutter's camp. But industry buildings work a little bit differently. They behave a little bit differently as we get to configure production chains there soon as our builders are willing to do that. All right, so I think we just are suffering from a graphical bug as I see that. Ah, oh, no, it's, it ain't done yet. Never mind. <laughs> just confused that they aren't built yet. Ah, yeah. So resource gathering camps are working just the same as this one, as you see there, with the only difference that the nodes will ultimately deplete. That's the uh, one thing. And an industrial building, finally. So you put in a worker there, and then you get to choose what shall be produced there. Planks, fabric, and bricks are of vital importance. Pipes, not so much, they are only needed for rain punk. You will do that in the beginning of the game, not so much. When you configure this, make sure that some of the materials that you use are highlighted, or if you don't pay any attention to the materials that you got, just activate them all. The crude workstation is really inefficient at everything it does, so I highly recommend to put limits in there so you don't waste your materials. Like here I say, just do 10 planks and hold them on, uh, hold on to them. And when we have a better building for planks, we change that here. You can put a check mark in here, whether you want to produce it or not. And of course, here again, priority can be applied to, so we can produce fabric over planks or however you want to put it. Okay, so when you open up a glade, let's do that once for uh, demonstration measures. Danger glades are like the name implies, always full of adventure and full of different other things. Here goes the storm season. As you see, our resolve goes down as we are suffering right now, not from too much hostility. All right. And here you see the, this is a patch of fertile soil. This is something where you can build your farms next to, as you see there. And this is a totem of denial. So you always have the choice to either destroy it or do something peaceful with it. You can invest resources here. As you see here, one type of resource has to be invested to get either this outcome or you invest the other type of resource to get the other outcome. So as you see there, we have the coal and the oil to do that. So we select burn down, put one person in, you select your reward and then you go for it. The timer runs now down and if you fail to do these, this will happen. If you succeed to do this, you will get those materials. The rewards are different depending on how you do it, but either way, these things have to be resolved. The reward for these areas here is that you get access to really nice resource nodes and you will be getting more building area to work with. So with that building area, you can expand your colony. You can build more hearths, as you see here, extra small hearths. They also reduce hostility and you gain stuff like these treasure chests, abandoned caches can be sent to the Citadel for reputation points. And from this point on, it's up to you how you go forward. These are your tools. You now know what you got to do. A new year begins. When a new year begins, you get new people to add into your colony and you gain a new cornerstone up until I think year 10 or so. And yeah, that's pretty much it. There's only one thing that I need to explain here still. That is the trading post. So you can build up a trading post that will attract a trader. This trader will come to your colony, buy your stuff and sell his stuff. This is a very, very useful feature. 
as you can buy things for your events or for your colony, various things apply. So to give you a few pointers where you should head towards to, try to get yourself a stable production of complex food as quick as possible, as this is the vit a vital part for your survival. Raw food is not ubiquitous enough to get your people through, so you need to get yourself access to complex food as fast as you can. And after that, get yourself access to a good income of building materials and then think about how you're gonna earn your reputation points and win the game before the queen is too impatient. Oh, and by the way, whenever you gain a reputation point, the impatience of the queen will go down again. All right, so this was a gross simplification of the entire game. There are so many more things that I could have talked about and should have talked about. I really did my best to give you a brief and quick, concise summary about all the things in the game, and I hope I did a good job at that. Leave your comments down below if you have any further questions or you feel like I should have added in things. Let me know there. I will try my best to answer your questions. And I'm also working on a more detailed series with a more detailed perspective into all of these things because this game is very deep and I really skimmed only over the surface of things. Thanks for watching. Leave a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and check out the description box. There's Patreon, PayPal, and Buy Me a Coffee. I'd be very delighted if you'd give them a look. And a big, 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 big thanks to all of the supporters there. I enjoy, I admire your support, and a really huge thanks to you as well. You've watched this video up until after the ad roll. Thanks for that. Have a wonderful day, and see you there.